uh, thank you to the CXD for having me. So I'm Solomon. Um, I graduated Bowdoin class of 22. So basically around last year now. And uh, I've been working for a year. I work at Google now. And I just kind of wanted to have this presentation because um, I know a couple of my mentees that I have at Bowdoin are um, ask me sort of the same sorts of questions. And um, I kind of figured, oh, well, if they have these questions, you know, four or five of them do, maybe like the entire Bowdoin community is kind of having these questions. I also had these questions too before I actually started working. So um, yeah, this segment is on how to rock your internship and how to earn a return offer. And I call it the ultimate guide for interns and people in any sort of rotational programs to expand their options and kind of get the best uh, that they can um, out of their internship. So here we go. So just as an agenda, I'll do an intro, kind of talk about the importance of what it means to get a return offer. Um, I'll give you the answer, and then I'll kind of go through a timeline of what I feel like the flow should be of an internship and where you should be at which stage and what, uh, which weeks. And then lastly, we'll leave some uh, time for Q&A. Excuse me. So just as a short intro, I'm Solomon. Um, I work at Google. Currently, I'm a cloud technical resident. Um, and it's a very big fancy word, it doesn't mean too much, but I will be transitioning jobs into something called customer engineering. Um, but yeah, that's besides the point. So I wanted to use symbols on the slide because we're gonna look at a lot of text later, but um, so yeah, let's take a break from it at least and do some images. Um, so I'm Ghanaian American. Uh, my mom was having me in Ghana, but then she decided, oh, like I could have him in the US and make him a citizen. So I was born in Jersey, but then uh, we moved to Ohio pretty quickly because the housing market was a lot cheaper. Um, so I have the block O from Ohio State, even though I went to Bowdoin, and I'm not trying to be a trader. Um, it just kind of represents, you know, where I grew up, spent, you know, 18 years of my life. And um, at Bowdoin, uh, I did a lot of different random stuff. Um, so my major is anthropology. Um, I did a CS minor and honestly, I didn't really like think I was going to make it through until like the last semester, but we made it through in terms of the CS minor. Um, my first year break, I was in Osher. My pre o trip was Katahdin. I'm a Thorn person all the way through. I used to do Molten back when I was on Res Life because my brick in uh, Res Life was more. So I would just slide out of bed, get food and slither back into bed. Um, and yeah, I used to run track. So that's a bit about me. And then during COVID, or at least at the end of uh, when COVID was sort of uh, the, the craze was going on, I was able to go abroad. I went to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. So I'm a huge proponent of people going abroad. <clears throat> so some experience and perspective that I want to offer and, and bring um, kind of like the why should you listen to me sort of thing is I think I've done like the most internships in Bowdoin history uh, accidentally. So I had like a, a year and a half of internship experience before graduating from Bowdoin. And so I did 11 months of that on Wall Street at a company called MSCI. And most of that was because it was COVID and it was virtual, right? So I was able to, you know, work from my bed. My boss asked me, he was like, hey, do you want to, you know, work in the dining hall or do you want to, you know, run some Excel sheets for me? And I was like, okay, I'll run some Excel sheets. Um, I later spent three months in big tech. I worked at Meta. And um, before that, my first year, I worked three months in higher ed, actually at Bowdoin. And I think that was probably the most fun internship that I had in terms of just being able to, you know, have my first job, be able to fail, be able to be around people who cared about me, be on a great campus. And it was just an amazing experience that I think definitely led me into getting these other jobs. So in terms of a breadth of experience, I've worked a lot of different things. So at Bowdoin, I did things for the analytics office. I did some alumni development. I did some higher ed research and I was even the mascot. So I would take pictures with the kids at like the hockey games, um, which is really cool. And then the next summer I was uh, working at MSCI and then that's when I did it for 11 months. They uh, sell products, uh, product research for index funds. So we sell it to companies like BlackRock, Bank of America and Chase. So they paired um, their product with our research and then you can go on Robinhood or Charles Schwab and go invest in those products. Next I was at Meta. Uh, we investigated data breaches, which is pretty cool, pretty interesting and a great company to do it at because there's a lot of data breaches, which is probably why they get sued a lot. And in the past year, 
I'm not an internship, but I was in a rotational program. I'm actually coming to a close with that program right now. And it was things of sales, tech sales, uh, cloud engineering, professional services, uh, engineering for the customers, so writing code for our customers and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So I said it to say, um, you know, bringing this year and a half of experience, being an intern, I think I've consolidated some, some good tips and um, I wanted to share them today. So I guess some of the results of that, um, which again, like I caveat, very important here, by far nowhere as ex successful as any Bowdoin people, you will meet some super insane, very smart people. But, you know, just within one year out, um, when I was at MSCI, I, I, the reason I got another five month ex extension was because I got promoted under a C-level manager to do some work for them. And they, the, the job was supposed to be for a VP. And then they're like, well, Solomon, like, why don't we just let Solomon do it? Which was kind of crazy to me. Uh, why would you let an intern report straight to a C-level manager? Don't know, but they let me do it. And it was a great experience. And um, at Meta, I got the highest possible return offer. So they have these buckets. Amazon has them too. Uh, they have these buckets where they put you and basically they rank you against other people. And if you do, if you're in the top bucket, they give you a top offer. If you're in the middle bucket, they give you like an average offer. And then if you're not in either of those buckets, I don't think you get an offer. And then lastly, at Google, the feedback that I got within the Google buckets where I was in the top 2%, which is I think the highest possible bucket. Now, uh, why is this important? Um, and I might jump around a bit here on this slide, but um, basically a return offer guarantees you so much security. Uh, you'll, this is usually a return offer is a commitment to you to say, you know, hey, Alan, you did an amazing job this summer. Uh, can you come back next summer to do another internship? Or, you know, could you, if you're a junior, hey, could you work with us full time later? And this is very important, especially for juniors. So you have a job lined up senior year and it gives you a lot of leverage. So and the first thing is uh, this deck is, exists because it's not really as simple as, you know, you work and you go home. Uh, there's a lot of work that people don't really talk about or that a lot of students don't really know what goes into working hard and what it means to do a good job at a corporate company. And you're not supposed to know, right? Cause you've never done something like this before. Or you've done it in a different caliber, but not to the point where, you know, companies make money and people live their lives and feed their children based off, off of these works, right? So it's not as simple as like, you know, you just get an A on a paper and then you do another paper. Um, next, if you really do well at an internship, you can build and grow extreme lifetime connections. I know anybody that I've worked with in my past internships or my past jobs would go out on, on a limb for me and write me a recommendation um, or they've actually offered me jobs as they move up, right? So I've been in jobs with people who are entry level, you know, and a year or two later, they remember me for something and they're like, hey, we're looking for, when I was interning, hey, we're still, we're looking for another intern. I know you did really dope work. Would you like to come, <clears throat> come work with us? Additionally, like now, like, you know, those are my friends, right? They're not just people that I reach out to for jobs. They're people that I check in with. They have a lot of knowledge in their field. And it all just came from the core stem of like doing a good job during the internship and then also being a decent person and they kind of reciprocate. The next is a return offer is gonna provide you the most job security that you can get, at least um, in most cases. I know some cases I've heard of people getting, some of actually my mentees at Bowdoin getting their return offer rescinded because the company had layoffs, but um, compared to not having an offer at all, like you at least know you have some um, some sanity knowing that, hey, I'm going to have something lined up for next year, um, especially senior year when everybody's scrambling to come to the CXD because maybe they weren't able to earn an internship or they didn't think they needed one. And, you know, it's the springtime and now they're like, Bethany, get me a job. And it's just, you don't want to be in that moment. You don't want to be in that stress. You know, you can get senioritis with class. I really got senioritis with class and job searching. So having a return offer for Meta literally changed my life. And I was actually able to help out my friends who wanted to get to the same place or different places. And I didn't have that same stress that they had. Next, it gives you a lot of leverage and a lot of options. So you have the ability to negotiate. Once you have one job, you can go back to another job and say, hey, you know, um, this, I really wanna work with you guys, but this job is giving me $20,000 more, right? Can we match that? Or, hey, I really wanna work with you, but you know, I wanna be able to do a Fulbright. So can I start next year? This job is letting me start next year. So you can kind of compare and contrast and kind of negotiate different things that you value, whether that be on an offer sheet or with some benefits. And you can only do that when you have another job. Um, 
I will say there are some cases where you can like ask really nicely and they might give it to you. But most of the time, if I wanted to raise, it was going to say, hey, you have to show me that BlackRock is actually going to give you 100K. And then from there, you could start talking more money or more benefits or a different start date. Um, and lastly, it's to enjoy your summer, uh, especially if you're working like a nice finance or a nice tech internship. What they'll do is they'll usually house you out there or they'll give you the option to be housed out there in a totally different city that you've never been to. And you don't have to pay rent. Some cases you do, some cases you don't. But I mean, the opportunity to live in a different place, to try it out just for three months, no strings attached, and then go back home to the comfort, comfort of your life and your safety. It's a really, really fun experience. I remember when I was at Meta, they flew me out to the Bay Area for three months and I had never really left Ohio, right? Um, and living in the Bay, having some, some throw, throw around money, meeting other cool interns that were my age and having fun in a whole different place kind of gave me a lot more confidence in my life. It kind of even gave me the confidence to go abroad. Um, I just said it to say, if it goes well, you can really enjoy your summer. You can know, hey, I'm killing it on my job. And now I have this other opportunity to explore more life. Um, so yeah, I feel like these are the reasons why I believe they're really important. Um, sorry. Uh, so before we begin, the preface that I want to make is I think these are three kind of statements you really have to believe within yourself before you can go in and do a good job. Number one is that you belong, right? So it's really easy to get imposter syndrome when you get a really nice job or something that you've always wanted to do, whether that's in art history, whether that's a pre-med research opportunity or whether that's a tech job, right? So they hired you out of thousands and thousands of applicants. And I don't want that comment to give you any pressure. It should actually give you confidence. That means, hey, we vetted through all these people. Um, there's no such thing as luck in these processes. There's no such thing as, hey, we're just gonna let this person skate by. Um, you know, I used to tell myself, I don't believe, I, before I, you know, I had a lot of imposter syndrome, I would say, I don't believe myself, but I do believe in capitalism. There's no way they'd waste thousands of dollars hiring and looking and searching for people. And they saw, you know, uh, when I think when I applied for Meta, I was one of 13 out of like, I think 4,000 who applied for the job, right? So I knew, at least in my head, okay, I'm one of 13 people out of X many people. I, I mean, they must have saw something in me, right? And that kind of gave me the first steps of kind of getting rid of my imposter syndrome. It's something that will always permanently go through, but it's one of the things that I had to tell myself, yeah, I belong, whether I believe it or not, you know, believe in capitalism. They will never just hire somebody just because. Um, next is you don't know anything and that's okay. You're there to learn, right? Especially if you're coming from a liberal arts college where you're not gonna go into, I mean, even if you go to a technical school like Ohio State and you did accounting, Right, that's very straightforward, but there's still going to be things on the job that you're not going to know. Um, nobody knows anything, and they don't expect interns to know anything. Right, they they put you through the interview process to vet that, and once they chose you, they already came in with this idea that they're going to have to teach you. So just whatever you think you know, just throw it out the window. Uh, you don't have to go and build three or four projects before you start. You don't have to go watch hours of YouTube videos before you start to get prepared. They will have training for you. They have resources for you, and um, You'll, you'll be prepared once you get there. The next is the best is objective. So you really kind of have to run your own race. Um, skills, especially like something like in tech, technical skills can be seen as the end all be all, but it's, it's not, right? Because if that was the case, they would just give you a coding challenge, the fastest algorithm would get the job. They would never even meet you. Um, whether that's something in finance too, like the, the top bucket analyst knows how to do a DCF from, from memory, you know, it's, it's just not true. The best is usually going to come down, come down to the person that people enjoy the most working with and that the people that get the job done and communicate well. So don't just be the best at one skill and think it's going to ride you throughout, you know, through the sunset. There's a lot of other things that you have to do. So this is the answer on how to get a return offer. Everything is going to fall under this one bucket. Your number one job is to make your boss's life easier. That's pretty much it. Um, the intern who makes their manager and their skip, le skip level managers, so that means their manager and their manager's manager's life easy, is the one that gets the job. So, excuse me, uh, there's a hierarchy of work. So there's like the C-level. And then the managing directors report to the C-level. So maybe the manager directors have a great idea. They're not going to be the ones doing the work. They're going to say, hey, executive directors, go do this work. The executive directors are going to look down at the VPs and say, hey, do this work. 
the VPs are going to look down to the analyst or to the associates, and the associates are going to look down to the analysts, and the analysts are going to look down to the interns. And then the interns do the grunt work, and then the analysts take credit, then the associates take credit, and it just kind of goes all the way up. So I said that to say, you need to focus on your silo, silo, which is the intern to the analyst or intern to associate, sometimes intern to ED. Um, if you can make the person who you report to's life easier, they will give you the job. And most of the time, it just comes down to that. You're really easy to work with and you do a good job. Now, these next uh, pillars that I'm going to show you are going to go into depth on how, what good job looks like, what a good job means. But if you remember one thing, you just need to make your boss's life easier. So if you're ever confused, think, am I making my boss's life easier or not? And if the answer is no, how do we make it easier? And if the answer is yes, how do we make it even easier, right? Um, so the key pillars that I like to think about are number one, do your job. It's really simple. And you might be saying this is common knowledge, but we'll, we'll get into it. Number two is you should move fast, move fast and ask questions. Number three is, uh, communicate and be helpful. And number four is bring yourself. Um, and we'll get into what that means. So first do your job. This is the most important one, right? If you don't do any other part, at least get your job done. So the reason why this is so imperative is because they hired you to do this one job. The analogy that I want to make is, you know, say your boss hired you to build a bridge. The bridge is your core work. This is your day to day. This is what they're checking in with you about. How is the bridge building going? This is the only thing that matters. You know, don't fall for any sort of distractions. At the end of your 12 week internship, if your boss comes back and says, hey, how's that bridge that I told you to build? Is it finished? And you say, hey, I didn't actually finish building the bridge. I'm only got halfway done, but I built like the city and I built like a Ferrari and I built a school. Your boss is gonna say, great, that's amazing. You helped other people out. You're not getting the job because all I did was ask you to build the bridge. So you need to crush building the bridge. Now, what does that mean? You need to find ways to build a bridge that are new, that are innovative. You, you have to kind of implement what you already know about building a bridge and use all your resources towards that. It's really gonna, gonna be, it's gonna be very easy to fall for distractions because once you get into your company, you're gonna see opportunities to join different groups or even your peers are gonna say, hey, you can help me with this project. This is gonna be a 10X project. We're gonna make the company so much money. Those are all distractions. You shouldn't be entertaining any of those unless you know you're absolutely crushing your day-to-day -day core, which is building the bridge. So don't fall for any distractions. Now, you might get to a point where you're doing your job so well and so efficiently that you have time to take up other projects. And if that's the case, do it. Run it by your manager. Hey, I'm two weeks ahead of the timeline. Do you think that I could have this much time to help somebody else? It's probably gonna take this much time out of my day, but I think it's gonna be important for the team because of X, Y, and Z reason. I'm all for it. But then if your manager says, no, I really want this bridge to build, be built, that's all I need from you. Um, don't do anything else, You know, then you need to listen to them because that's the person that's gonna control whether you get the return offer or not. Uh, usually it's the person that you report to and then the person that they report to has the uh, the final say or maybe a hiring manager does, but all that feedback is going to come from the person that you have the day to day interactions with. So if you only listen to one thing that's it just build the bridge don't go building a city if you haven't built the bridge yet. Next, you have to be able to discern what's important and you have to be able to run your own race. Do not focus on the fanciest thing. The best people that I've ever worked with are the people that know the basics so well that uh, they're confident in it. They, you can't question them on the basics, right? So I have a little anecdote, at least for this one. Um, basically for what I did in my, um, in my Meta, uh, when I was working for Meta was, um, we were investigating data breaches or my team did, and they needed to understand how the website works when you know, a third party uses uh, the code from Facebook and uses it on the website. So my job was to build a website and show them the functionality of how it works when a third party is using our code. Now, what that meant for me is, um, you know, I could have built the prettiest website of all time, right? I could have built like unimi.com or the, uh, a replica of the Bowdoin website, but that wasn't really what they're asking me to do. They were really asking me, hey, every time when I click a button on the website, what do we see on our, on our back end, right? So you have to be able to understand what's important. Don't spend two weeks learning on YouTube how to make a website look pretty. You know, spend two weeks learning how to make the website functional, right? You have to be able to discern what's important. On top of that, run your own race. 
Um, the last thing that you should ever be doing is looking at another peer, another intern and saying, oh my gosh, you know, they have X many projects done already, or they have this many projects. You don't know the relationship with their manager. You don't know how long it took them to do those projects. All you know is what you have. So finish the food that's on your plate and build the bridge and understand what's important to building the bridge. Next, you got to be flexible. So going back to the, to the meta example, uh, it was 12 other interns and they're all Ivy League students. They're all Harvard, Stanford, Princeton grads, and here's me, the only Bowdoin grad. And what we found out within the first week there is that the job that we all were hired to do is pivoting. So now everybody who only specialized in doing that job, everybody was in the meeting, just throwing their hands up. Some people turned their camera off. Some people left the meeting. Their attitude was, hey, you didn't sign me up for this, or I didn't sign up for this. I'm not going to do it. I was the only one that smiled and said, when do we start? Give me a resource and point me to who I should talk to to learn how to do this thing. And that will always take you further than groaning because something moves. If you're going to work in a, in a space like tech or in healthcare or in art, um, you're moving into a space where things are changing so much and so, much, so many things are up to opinion that you can't, you can't be mad once you start working and you find out it's not exactly what you signed up for. Your boss wants the person who's going to smile in the face of adversity and say, when do I start? So be that person. Uh, next, have a nose for impact. So this is after you've built the bridge. Talk around with your team and say, if you had one thing that can make your life easier, what would that be? And that's where the impact is going to lie. You know, I have a couple of examples of where I was killing my day-to-day -day job so well that I went through my team and I was just like, hey, if there's like something that it's probably going to take, you know, a week or two to do, but you don't have the time to do it, that would help everybody out, what would it be? And everybody's like, for some reason, if we could just fix this, our lives would be so much easier. And then you fix that and that's building the bridge and then building the city afterwards. And then you get, you know, that's how you get the return offer. That's how you get the, the higher rating because not only are you doing really well in your day job, you're doing stuff that's gonna help other people to like you and other people to understand your worth as well. And lastly, keep a ledger of work. Uh, everything that you do, write it down. Everything important that you do, write it down. Every good thing that somebody says about you, write it down. And this is important because you're gonna get to the end of your 12 weeks and What's going to happen is uh, you're either going to get, you know, hey, you should, we should recommend Solomon to keep this job or, or not. And in the event that it's ever not, what you can do is you can say, why am I not getting this job? And maybe they say you didn't work hard enough. You can show them a list of a Google Doc or of, of, of a journal of all the work that you've done and say, I had this impact, which my boss said, you know, is a 10x impact. I had this impact with my which unblocked my peer to go do something that earned X million dollars in revenue. If you have a ledger of the work that you've done, nobody can uh, deny what you're saying. And maybe you might think the people that you're with are super great, they're wholehearted and they never try to try to play you in that sort of way. And maybe it's unintentional. Maybe sometimes people don't even know the work that you're doing, but you have to make sure that your work is visible in some sort of way. And you have to have that proof. You have to be able to defend yourself at any time. You know, I, I told you at Google, we have these ratings. For me to get the highest possible rating, I literally had a list and a ledger of all the work that I had done. So if they try to give me the average rating, I would say, we need to reconsider because I've done X, Y, and Z, which you told me falls under this bucket. So I so said that to say, this is like the most important slide. And um, this will be in the recording. I'll send the slide deck out. This is the, this is the bread and butter of how you get your job back. Everything else is going to really, really help. So next, move fast and ask questions. So number one, well, first of all, to move fast doesn't mean to like put out a really bad rough draft of something. To move fast means to ask questions, to do whatever's in your control immediately, to research and to make recommendations. So for example, you need to ask questions. If you get a project, you have to be very proactive. Think about the questions about, you. maybe you haven't started yet, think about what you might face in the future. Hey, how can I get ahead of this thing that's gonna happen in the future? Um, so think about those questions. Additionally, if you're blocked and there's something that your manager or your boss can help you out with, and it's only going to take them a minute to explain it versus you've been digging for hours and hours, just go ask them. It will never hurt. And actually the progress you'll make being unblocked is going to weigh Trump over the fact that you had to ask somebody for help and they're there to help you to begin with. Next, if it's in your control, do it now. You should be waiting on a response, not waiting to respond. So if they tell you, hey, Bethany, I need you to reach out to Leah and, and coordinate this meeting. Don't wait until tomorrow because it might take Leah three more days to get back. And maybe the deadline was on Friday and you waited till Wednesday and then they didn't get back to you until Tuesday. If they tell you to do it on Monday, just do it on Monday. That's what it means to move fast. It means to act 
on things immediately as fast as you can and do your best at, at the moment and not waiting for two or three days after. Next, research, research, research. Dig through every resource you can and try to reach out to other people. You know, don't always go to your boss or your manager. Try to build relationships with your peers. Throw 20 minutes on the calendar. Maybe ask them that question and then get to learn about them a little bit more. Build those relationships, but always research. You know, don't ask your boss a question that you probably could have Googled, you know. Uh, the way that I discern this is maybe you have a project specific question that's a clarification on what you're expected of. You can't find that in Google, so ask your boss. But maybe it's, hey, how do I center a div? You can go on stackoverflow.com and find out how to center a div. Or, hey, how do I do a DCF cash flow? May you can go on Investopedia and find that out. So you need to find out what's discernible and you need to find out how long it's going to take you to do something. And then is there a resource that I can find? Or maybe if your boss doesn't know it or someone else who pointed you to someone doesn't know it, hey, could you point me to someone else who might have an idea? And you chase all those people down until you get the answer. Lastly, always make a recommendation. So that means if your boss is asking you to do something, hey, uh, we're at the Art History Museum and you're the head of curation right now and they want something curated in a Marilyn Monroe, you know, Great Gatsby sort of style, right? Um, if, that, if that's your prompt, the, you might be confused on what that means, but when you come, you should never just come up to your boss with empty hands and say, what do I do? You say, hey, I understand you wanted a Great Gatsby style. I searched up these sorts of things. I've already talked to these people and used these resources. My opinion is we should do this this way and we should hang up these three art pictures in this certain order. And what do you think? Then your boss says, hey, this person actually did the work. They did the research. All they need is another opinion versus nobody wants to be working for the person or nobody wants to work with the person that's like, you gave me a thing and I'm just going to ask you 400 questions before even trying it or thinking about it or even giving you a recommendation or showing any work that I've done towards it. Maybe you've done three days of research towards something. You have to make that known. Hey, I've been looking at this for the past three days. I've talked to these contacts. This is what I think should happen, but I'm still unsure. What do you think? And they'll appreciate that so much because maybe they don't even have the context, but the feedback that I used to get was, you know, thank you. I didn't even know what, to, what the context was. I would probably have to go Google it for an hour, but you brought me all your findings and I was able to give you a recommendation on the spot with all, the, with all that context. So that's what it means to move fast. So we're starting to wrap up here. Lastly, communicate, or second to last, communicate and be helpful. So get help. Again, don't wait until you're blocked for four days before you ask a question, get help. Next, be a team player. Um, so my girlfriend works at a cryptocurrency company. She's a software engineer. And actually she had um, a team member who was able to do something that she wasn't able to do. And uh, the time was up, it was like 5.30, everybody was going home. She asked the team member, hey, uh, could you help me do this thing? I know we're over time, but uh, if you're not busy, could you just help me out? This other person wasn't busy. They just didn't, they're like, hey, let's talk about it tomorrow because I don't want to be on the clock. Now that's completely fair. But when it comes to being a team player, my girlfriend can now make that recommendation and say, in the time where I needed to talk to them for an extra minute, they didn't give me that time. Whereas if you're that person that might go that extra 20 minutes and explain it to someone and then say, hey, we're going to touch back on this tomorrow. I'm going to check in and see how you're doing. You know, that's what it means to be a team player. It means giving up a bit of your time or helping someone else catch up to where you are because it's not a competition, it's about collaboration. Uh, that's, those are the type of people that everyone wants to work with, you know, and also respect your own time. If you know you have somewhere to be, then don't take it up and be sincere when you say, hey, I'm gonna reach out tomorrow, let's do this tomorrow. But don't just brush people off. Always try to help whenever you can. And lastly, always actively ask how you can support. If your boss is going through something, hey, I have a fire drill right now. Don't talk to me for the next two days. Even if they, you know they're going to say there's no way you can help, just be like, is there any way I can support you? Because you can either help in that small way, which is monumental for them, or they'll be like, no, you have no clue what's going on, but I really appreciate that. And I would love to keep working with somebody who does that. Lastly, you want to bring you, bring yourself, be memorable, right? So speak up in meetings. Do not wait until week eight before people know what your name is. Speak up in meetings immediately. Maybe if it's something, a super hard technical topic where you're learning, you know, even if you're asking a clarifying question, it'll make you more memorable. Um, join ERGs, right? So at Google, we have the Black Googler Network. We have um, like the Asian Googler Network. I'll join and just be an ally. You know, if they have any event, I'll go sit, I'll go listen. Kind of what we're doing at, you know, what we did at Bowdoin, right? Or what you're doing at Bowdoin or what you should be doing. Learn about other people's perspectives. Next, add your own perspective. 
feel free to share about your lifestyle, your friends, your family, if it's relevant to work. Now, obviously, I don't want you to, you know, go dump your girlfriend or boyfriend drama uh, on, on your boss, right? But if they're ever talking about, you know, hey, you know, I traveled to this place, you can say, oh, maybe I've never traveled there before, but I have a friend that's from there. And, you know, have you ever heard about this cultural thing, right? Bring your own perspective, bring yourself. And lastly, build connections. Uh, if you can, you know, you're doing really well at your job, set, schedule one-on-ones with random people at the company that do really cool things that you might want to do. So at MSCI, I made 35 connections, which is bad because I was there for a year. I probably should have made more, but I, I was trying to juggle school and work. At Meta, for that, for that two and a half months, I made 65. And then now it's been a year at Google and I have 167. And it's not really about the number. It's just these are people that I genuinely know. If I have a question, they'll answer for me or they know they can depend on me to get something done or help them out with something or to, to kind of leverage them and connect them other places. And these are either lifelong friends or lifelong business connections. For the last slide, before we get to questions, uh, I want to go through a 12-week internship timeline. I know some people's might be eight, some people's might be 10, but um, the 12-week internship timeline, this is kind of where you should be. Now, every internship is different and every relationship with their boss is different. Every job is different. Um, this is just like the cookie cutter where I think if someone gives you one project to do for 12 weeks, this is what she should be doing. So within the first week, the first three weeks, you honestly should just be onboarding. Don't feel a pressure to contribute. Don't feel any sort of pressure to, to work. Don't think that they're going to fire you if you're not blowing them out of the water. The first three weeks, you should be setting up your laptop and learning people's names, right? But you should also be attentive in the meetings. You should be taking notes, understanding the language that people are using, asking questions about the language. This is the part where you get up to speed. Next, week two to three, you and your boss should have expectations of what success looks like. Ask your boss, what, do, what does a successful intern do in this role? What does it look like for you? And if they say at the end, it's the intern that builds the bridge, you know that's your North Star metric and every decision you make should be, is it getting this bridge built faster or is it slowing it down? So by week two or three, you should have your expectations set. And um, by week three, three to four, you should start picking up tasks now. So ideally, as early as you feel comfortable, you should be picking up tasks. Like for me, I like to pick up tasks week two while I'm still understanding or even week one if they'll let me. But three and four are the latest weeks that you can start contributing. By this time, people should already know that you can at least, you know, uh, do something small or help out or set up a meeting or take notes. This should be your, your aim or your goal or pushing code. Uh, week six is usually going to be a, a midpoint check-in. So this is where you literally ask your boss, am I on track to get a return offer or not? And if not, how do we get there? This is going to be very painful for some people because this is where you're going to get the first piece of feedback that you're not doing as great as you think, or you're doing amazing, but there's still better that you can be doing. Focus on the feedback that's genuine. Don't let somebody, you know, bash you and say, hey, you don't know anything. I hate having an intern. You'll never have the... I mean, hopefully you'll never run into those scary stories. I've done a year and a half of internships. I've never even come close to that. But week six should be where they're like, hey, Solomon, you're really great at communicating. You do amazing presentations. The quality of your code is not up to par. It's nowhere near where we want it to be. Now, then you ask your boss, how do we fix that? And if we fix this issue, is it important enough to where you will now give me a return offer if I can fix this? They'll probably say, hey, read through this documentation, take this coding camp for a week, you know, maybe do some extra hours here and there, and then you'll be on track. And then you, I feel confident in you by week uh, 10 or 12 to get a return off. This is the part where you take off, you know, your, your pride and you say, help me get better and help me help you. And you have to be explicit and say, am I on track to get a return offer? Am I on where in those bubbles? Am I in the top bracket? Am I in the low bracket? And how do I get to the top bracket? How do I get to the average bracket? How do I get to the above average bracket? Week seven, you should be taking ownership of your project. And by week eight, honestly, you should be in your prime. And this doesn't mean that you know everything about what's going on. This means that you're moving, you're taking on responsibility, you're raising your hand for work, you're taking accountability for things. People know you as the point person for this project. By week 10, your project should actually be done. Um, most times they'll tell you you have 12 weeks, uh, especially for my people working in tech or working in finance, make sure it's done by week 10. So you have 11 and 12 to either sharpen it, to get feedback on it, or just, you know, just to be chilling out. So for me personally, my meta project wasn't done until week 12, but that's because we had a week 10 pivot. But I said that to say, you know, they told me my project was gonna, at week 10, it's gonna take another 10 weeks for you to do this. I was like, well, 
no, it's not because I'm going to do this in two weeks. Right. And that even that contributed to me getting the highest possible return offer that they could give me. And it's not because I was a superstar or anything. It's just because I understood what needed to get done. But by week 10, I had a solid draft before they told me to, to revise. So especially for, you know, if you're going to be working at Amazon software engineer, your project should be done by week 10. Um, and yeah, week, week 11 and 12, you're waiting on the decision from the hiring manager, whether you can return or not. So that's everything that I had. I know that's a lot. And I know I sped through some parts. This is recorded. So hopefully you can go back and read through it. But at this point, I will take any questions that anybody has. And if not, then thanks for having me. I guess uh, I had a question on my mind. Um, thank you for the wonderful speech. I really learned a lot and gained a lot of insight. Uh, one of the things that I'm worried about personally is, um, you know, I've heard a lot about the working culture at Amazon and, you know, I don't know, ultimately that comes down to the manager and the team and the projects that I'm working on. Um, and I see the draw in the, like, how important a return offer is. But also I was wondering if you've had ever like some sort of burnout or you felt like in your internship, you've had to take a break. How do you balance uh, pursuing this, but also not letting it consume you? Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, especially because I think um, I would be very remiss if I didn't tell you that Amazon's not going to be a walk in the park, but they also hired you because they know that you're not going to be the person that can't handle it. Um, so the culture is very different there. Um, and I guess to generalize the advice, um, honestly, if I feel like if you hone down on these key points, whether the culture is a tougher one or an easier one, your, your boss will always appreciate you. Now, in terms of burnout, mm -hmm. Uh, some problem that you might face is on it. So when I was at Meta, some of the Harvard interns that they had did like three projects, right? So they did three internship projects in the time that it took me to do one, right? So the first thing that you're thinking is, holy crap, like how am I going to get a return offer when yeah. we have, you know, the next coming of Mark Zuckerberg, right? And I'm just here <laughs> learning how to tie my shoes by week five. Um, and that's honestly when it comes down to running your own race and honing down on what you can. So for me, I communicated with my manager at every point where I am. So me and him would have Monday and Friday check-ins. And so he originally just wanted to do once a week on Monday, but I said, hey, let's add a Friday. So on Monday, I can say, hey, this is what I'm working on this week. What do you think about that? Or do you have any adjustments? And then on Friday, this is what I worked on. This is what I'm preparing to tell you on Monday that we're gonna work on. Where can we go? And then additionally, I would also add in how I'm personally feeling. Hey, like I'm at a hundred percent bandwidth. I cannot take another thing or else my, my, I'm going to break. So can you help me reprioritize what's really important here? Or if you think I need to stay, you know, if you think it's appropriate for me to take more work, if you're adding more work, what is the most important part about all this? Because at the end of the day, I want to do something productive for me and productive for you. What's going to help you the most? I know not every single piece of this is going to be as important as the other one. What's important for you? Um, you know, my, thankfully the culture at Meta was like, Sometimes my boss would ping me at 2 p.m. and be like, just like turn off your laptop, like go go have fun outside, right? Go go enjoy the Bay Area, come back, right? And then there'd be other days where it's like from nine to five, somebody's messaging me or they're throwing me into meetings. To be able to balance that is kind of the dance that you have to do once you get into your internship. But communication will always be number one because the last thing that you wanna have is a surprise, right? So if your midpoint review is a surprise and your final review is a surprise, something went very, very wrong. So if your midpoint comes up, and they're like, hey, I just want you to know you're nowhere on track, right? Well, then you have that conversation with your manager, like, hey, we meet twice a week. You had six weeks to give me this feedback. In the future, I would love for you to give me feedback in real time so that I'm not getting this in, the, in a lump sum. So what that does for you is it shows your manager, hey, this person's really mature. I just, I just dumped a whole load of crap on them that I probably shouldn't have even done. But they're taking it the right way. This is how they handle adversity. I really, really want to work with them. So that's to say, you also shouldn't be pressured to work more than 40 hours, to be honest. Um, and if you're not getting your work done within, like, if you're truly staring at your screen and locking in for eight hours a day, your work is going to get done. It might be very stressful. You might have to wait on a lot of people. But that's when it comes back to moving fast, you know. 
letting your manager know, even if you don't have an update on the job, hey, I'm waiting for these three people to get back to me. They haven't gotten back to me yet. And that could just be a ping or a message. You know, I used to talk to my manager daily. Hey, this is where I'm at. I'm waiting for this person to get back. And they'd be like, you know, that person is never going to get back to you. How about you ping this person instead? And you just immediately go ping them. And then you wait for a response for them. Maybe you check in in two days. Hey, you haven't gotten back to me. I need to get back to my manager. Um, these are, I feel like these are some, some tools that you can use to try to help a, a stressful environment. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to, if your manager and your day-to-day -day advisor just, uh, sorry, if your manager and your day-to-day -day advisor just hate you, then you're in trouble, but you're probably never, ever going to have that, that sort of issue. So actually it was funny because as we were talking, my manager just pinged me too, but um, <laughs> he was just saying, what's up, but <laughs> I said to say for you, for you personally, I think uh, even though the culture is tough, the people are what's going to take you through. I'm sure you're going to land a great manager who cares about you and really wants you on your team. Thank you, Solomon. That was really insightful. Appreciate it. Yeah, glad I could. Have kind of a piggyback question that I would just love your thoughts on because, um, you know, somebody might really like the company this summer, but might realize the team isn't really for them, or maybe they just don't jive with their supervisor. Um, what would you do? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, this is this is the part where you help yourself by doing an amazing job, by giving yourself the option to come back to this team, but then also giving yourself the option to go interview elsewhere. So what you can do is you can, you know, you just got to tough it through those 12 weeks. And you know, I actually reflected, I, I sat down and wrote all the pros, of the pros and cons of going back to Facebook. You know, pros, I really like this. I like my team. They're nice people. Cons, the work is terrible. It made me want to pull my hair out. They're not going to pay me enough. Like, you know, just really be honest with yourself about what you want. And because you had that return offer, I mean, this was for me junior year going to, into senior year. They gave me until I think November, October 15th. And then I had extended again to November 15th. So I knew I had from the end of that summer all the way through November 15th. And now that I had this return offer, I had that leverage um, so to go interview elsewhere. The other thing is I was also very vocal and open with my manager about things that I liked and things that I didn't like, uh, obviously in a very appropriate way, right? Um, so I literally would tell him, hey, I would really love to, you know, thank you, after I got the offer, of course, thank you for the offer. I would really love to return to this team, but these are three or four aspects that just like make this work really unsustainable for me. So if I came back, is there any reassurance that we can move on these points where it's like, hey, I wanted to work on projects that I felt like were more meaningful to the skills that I wanted to learn. Or I wanted to be closely aligned to a different team that has more opportunity for me. And, you know, because they really want you, the HR, they're going to really work with you and try to say, hey, okay, maybe you can talk to this manager on this team and see if you can place here. Um, so I said to say, constant communication is great, but then also having, just doing the the your absolute best job to secure that offer will give you the leverage to go look for something else and say, hey, at the end of the day, I know I'm going to at least go back to a job where I know what to do. I know what they're going to ask of me. I might not like it, but now I have job security and I can go interview other places. So I th that's why I think it's very pivotal. I think that's a really great question, though. Um, but that's just my opinion. I also know that other people might feel a different way. Some people would be like, you know, quit immediately. And that's <laughs> for me. I'm like, you have to have some sort of income coming in before you make other sort of sorts of decisions. Yeah. Um, is she going to add something, Kristen? Oh, I can't hear you for some reason. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear Kristen? I can hear Kristen. Oh, weird. <laughs> oh, Alan can't hear Kristen. Yeah, I can't either. Oh, weird. <laughs> I heard you before. <laughs> so strange. I heard her say she can't hear you. So. <laughs> oh, she can't hear me? I think. I think, but I think she's muted. That's like the weirdest issue ever. <laughs> That's okay. We can talk tomorrow. <laughs> you would think like two years of Zoom, like the tech would be finished. But like, <laughs> we, I don't, I always say that if it, even at Google, right? Like we'll join a meeting and something won't work. And we're like, we wouldn't be working in tech if everything worked, right? So, <laughs> so you'd be out of a job. It's all. It's all <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, if you, uh, oh, Kristen, you're going to say something brilliant, I bet. Um, I'll open the chat just in case. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that was super helpful. Thank you so much for taking the time, Solomon. I thought that was super interesting. 
think I have more things I can pick your brain about probably with your own experiences at some of these companies, but um, any last- I'm back. Oh, yeah, you. Oh. Yeah, there you are. Well, now that we've, you know, entirely ruined the recording, but um, I, I was just- <laughs> I'm cut this in part anyway, so it's we can be hard, It's a hard question. It's so hard, it froze Zoom. Um, <laughs> My question is kind of, you know, in college, you're training to be an independent thinker and be like, I think this whole system is crazy. I think the whole country should be run this way. I can't believe, you know, this technology is even being invented. It's like the worst idea ever. Sure. So how do you reconcile? Like you might have thought in week 10 when that pivot came, like, this is not the right way to go. Or I think the city is a more important thing to build than mm-hmm. the, my bridge that I was assigned. So how do you reconcile being like an independent thinker with like a ton to contribute and this method you have so well described for like, how do you reconcile that? Is it like, if I do this stuff right, I get the opportunity to make the case for the city when they hire me back? Is it like, maybe they know met more than me because like they've been building bridges longer? But how do you like make sense of that for yourself? Wow. I mean, I think that's an amazing question. As I, I, it's another reason like, so for me, when I was working in finance, it was very one line of thinking. It was like, they didn't want any innovation. They had a system that worked and they would just wanted somebody, like it could have been me or it could have been like, you know, Johnny Two Shoes, right? Somebody was just gonna do it and replicate what they had. And I feel like for me, that's why I sort of pivoted into tech to where, you know, they're asking you, hey, I like uh, build, build us a bridge and you get to be like, but why do you, why do you actually want the bridge? And they're like, oh, well, we want the bridge so people can get over. It's like, hmm, have you thought about a moat instead? Why did you not use a moat? And they're like, huh, well, I guess I never really thought about it, but I guess a moat could work too. Which one would be easier? So I said that to say, um, this kind of, I mean, this is a perfect point to like bringing your own perspective. Um, as you're going through it, you're going to become the subject matter of that thing. So you're going to know what it means and what it takes to, to get something done. You might even find, find and stumble on different ways to do things that could completely break the system and completely change. And usually that third, uh, I almost said third party, that extra line of thinking, which is, that's why they hire Bowdoin students, right? That's why they hire liberal arts students is because we're there to show them a way. It's like, no, you don't actually need a bridge. You just, you actually wanted a yacht. So we let's build you a yacht, which is way cooler, way more impact, can carry more people and can get you across too. Um, and that'll all just come from your, your perspective. So, I mean, even with my project, I, I kind of reconvinced my boss of what he wanted. He's like, hey, you know, we want this app that does X, Y, and Z, and we want this. And I was like, well, you know, after I built it for two or three weeks and I talked to some other engineers who had a, a lot more perspective on what it means to build it, I was like, I think actually what you're asking for is this, and this is going to be a lot easier. It's going to change our timeline. It's going to help us out, right? Um, so it's that perspective of like, you know, completely revamping. I, I love this. Uh, my art teacher used to say too, like she loved working with third and fourth graders because then they're not too young to not understand anything, but they're not too old to where their imagination doesn't exist. Interns are kind of in the spot too. Interns and entry-level people, you haven't been like tainted by the way that people already do things. So you get to pull from the best of the best doing it, but then also pull from your own imagination and saying, how can we reimagine this? So uh, bring your perspective. I definitely think you should be like, man, we could build like a city bridge instead of just a b- bridge or a city, right? So yeah, find find your ways of impact in that. Um, but again, you know, don't get distracted because I feel like sometimes I had a lot of really, really cool idea, ideas, but they were way out of the 12 week project timeline, but I would talk to my boss about them and then, you know, I finished my project and then they're like, hey, can you build that thing now? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And then next thing you know, you're in the top bucket, right? So, yeah. Thanks for the advice. Of course, of course. Thanks for the question. That was actually, a, these are some some great questions. We um, get them. <laughs> We're just, these are the these are the good ones that I always, you know, it's nice to sort of gut check them against, you know, live experience and you also just did a really good job articulating what's exciting about the tech industry. So <laughs> that, was good. that was a bonus. <laughs> yeah, I'm like trying not to accidentally keep branding people to work in tech, but I'm like, I'm like, it's I don't okay. know. 